good morning to everyone, a little earlier than usual. Um, we're happy to have you all Groman here today from Hebrew University, who's, and he's going to tell us about torsion of non-exact embeddings of Liouville domains. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for, uh, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, okay, so I want to apologize first that uh, um, I'm not entirely well set up with the technology here because it's not exactly the way I wanted it, but fine. Uh, and also like this talk is kind of like a work in progress. So I hope I won't say anything wrong, um, but certain, certain things will be uh, unpolished. Uh, so, but please bear with me because I'm trying to share kind of a, a circle of ideas rather than kind of a polished result. Okay, so our setup is uh, we start with a symplectic manifold uh, um, M omega is a symplectic manifold, which we assume is, is either uh, closed or geometrically bounded. Okay, this is. An, um, we we uh, uh, then we, we consider we have a, a Liouville domain um, uh, D theta, and uh, and we consider a symplectic embedding. Um, of of D in, uh, into M, such that the so so it's only a symplectic embedding. There's no there's no exact. There, we cannot talk about exactness in the setting, and th this is the setup we want to discuss. And to such a setup, uh, we can associate uh, two uh, 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 two two, uh, two uh, invariants. Uh, so there's like relative symplectic homology of uh, the uh, second uh, relative symplectic homology of uh, uh, of d of kind of the i uh, of d relative to m, uh, which is kind of we're considering the Fleur homology of the function, uh, which is uh, um, zero inside and uh, infinity outside, uh, and then we can uh, consider. Uh, something I call intrinsic symplectic homology, which is the same thing, but instead of considering, but, but we always to D, we have an, a, a, an associated uh, geometrically bounded manifold, which is its own completion. And that's something which, uh, which is done by, uh, that, that's something which is associated to, to D kind of canonically up to symplectomorphism. So we can talk about, about that. And then the question uh, is, so, so okay, so, so these are like two invariants. And in a sense, which will be made precise, uh, uh, hopefully, I'll get there. Um, we can think of now we both are uh, invariants, but both invariants are homology of chain complexes, which are uh, generated by uh, critical points uh, inside uh, of, of D and reborbits on the boundary of D. So, so this is actually like a non trivial statement, what I'm saying here, um, but it's and it's one. On the, from the technical point of view, that's one of the contributions of this work that I want to talk about. Uh, so, so, so now, so, so as chain complexes, they're the same, but when we consider uh, the differential, uh, so for intrinsic symplectic homology, it's, it's like counting flow trajectories, which uh, remain inside the, the domain, while for, uh, uh, while for, uh, um, uh, for, for, for the uh, 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 relative symplectic homology, there is in addition, uh, there's global trajectories. So maybe I have some space to draw. Okay, so, so here I have some space to draw. And, and of course, the question that I want to discuss is the question of locality, which is uh, what is the relation between uh, intrinsic and, uh, and relative uh, symplectic homology? Um, okay. Uh, so are there any questions about what I said so far? Um, um, I, I just wanted to ask, when you were talking about Hamiltonian Fleur homology of a generalized function? Yes. Is, it's, um, is this? It's just a notion, uh, just a shorthand for like taking a limit. Like there is a, no, there's, there's like you can define the, the kind of domain of definition of Fleur homology is for general uh, lower semi-continuous functions, but but in the end it's defined by taking some kind of limit uh, in a an appropriate way, like of of the monotone sequence of Hamiltonians which uh, converge pointwise. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
generalized. Does um, okay. So yeah. Now, what is the motivation for this question? Um, uh, so one is that often in, in settings that we are interested in, uh, the intrinsic symplectic homology is well understood, and the other is that often uh, we can kind of understand. We want to study global floor theory, like quantum cohomology. Then we can often uh, piece together uh, the global thing by uh, decomposing it to local pieces. Uh, in something called a quasi-tropic fibration. Maybe I should have written it down here. Uh, then there is a spectral sequence, which o Umut uh, introduced in his uh, thesis. So combining these two, you could hope to uh, gain some understanding of, of the global Fleur theory. Uh, and I'm kind of repeating myself. So, so the motivation is uh, 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 comes from SYZ mirror symmetry. So, so this is kind of the thing I, I have in the back of my mind when I think about these things. Uh, so, so we consider this special case where um, you start with some integral affine manifold singularities. Um, you have uh, a Lagrangian torus vibration, and then you consider some uh, convex polytope uh, in the base, which may or may not include singular values. Uh, and um, and consider that you have some kind of local model for uh, for an SYZ fibration, which means like what I'm saying here is okay. So if, if it doesn't contain singular values, then then you're you're considering something which looks like uh, a neighborhood of a, a Lagrangian torus. So you're looking at you're talking about the cotangent bundle of the torus. If you have singularities, assume that these singularities are in some sense nice. So uh, so nice in this case is. That there are there are some certain particular model of singularities. So, for example, you can consider uh, uh, singularities in the Ross Hebert type. So, uh, for which I give like these two examples. So, so consider these two uh, affine uh, varieties. They, they can be considered symplectic manifolds. So, there's the positive vertex, uh, the negative vertex, and each of them. Maybe I should have also mentioned kind of there's the uh, nodal singularity. So, so you could consider kind of you have uh, in, in dimension two, you have uh, something which it's like x, y equals one plus u, and you, ha and you have kind of a, a torus vibration where the generic fiber is, is, is a torus, and then you have some, some singular nodal fiber. Uh, so, so that's the nodal singularity. Uh, and, you, and you have this thing also when you talk about uh, positive and uh, uh, negative verte vertice uh, vertices. Where, so where I did not spell out uh, what is the torus vibration, but you should think of them as also having, uh, 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 being as uh, Lagrangian torus vibrations. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, consider, so, so consider this case, sorry. And then um, now, so, so maybe I should have said, and consider the case where D is kind of a Liouville domain, and then uh, consider, uh, that the image of D is uh, uh, is um, is one of these uh, is one of these uh, uh, um, um, so the image of D is 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 kind of a pre-image of or basically it's a local model for for the for the S Y Z fabric. Um, is is maybe this is not written out so clearly? So is there any question about what I'm saying? I see one question from uh, from Marco Castronovo. Marco, you can unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask. Uh, supposedly, this is a list. Uh, and I mentioned, where do I find this list of, of what of, the, of gross Siebert singularities? Uh, I've heard many question. people talking about it. So I think. Well, uh, I don't know where you can find this list. I don't know what is the official definition, but uh, like what I'm thinking of is the generalization of this. So it's kind of, so maybe, yeah. So it's something where you take, you have, see like you see that here you have like a product of three things and then a sum of one thing or a product of two things and a sum of, of so, so it's kind of the generalization of this. So, sorry, it's kind of you, you uh, I think the one place where I saw this was a talk by Mohammed. So I don't know if there was a, but probably there is a, a, a source for this. So, so, so it's something which looks like this, uh, an uh, something defined by an equation 
like this, where the U, uh, where the X, I are in C and the uh, UI are in C star. And there's kind of, kind of an obvious way of, of defining a, a, a torus vibration on this, uh, on this thing. But I don't, I don't want to pause for too long for this. But yeah, you only asked what is the, where's the list? I don't, I don't really know. Like sometimes people, yeah. But this is what I, yeah. When I say Rossi, but singularities, I mean this, because maybe some people have a, more, a different notion. Um, okay. Um, okay, any other questions? So I see there are like four. Um, it's just us answering the question in chat. Aha, uh -huh. okay. It, uh, is my is my definition the correct one or? Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the thing is that gross Ebert ha basically have these as some basic ones and then there's some covers of them that show up. We should want you to worry okay, okay. too much. Okay, okay, I see. Um, okay, sorry. So, okay, so so uh, so this is the model. This is the the, 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 the example in the back of our mind. And the and kind of kind of a pet project which uh, Omut and I have been thinking for a long time, like basically we think we've been discussing this like for three years now, is uh, to try to kind of prove classical mirror symmetry just using uh, closed string methods. So uh, so basically reconstruct a non-Archimedean mirror by piecing together, uh, basically uh, taking spec of these of these local pieces. Um, uh, and then uh, use the uh, uh, spectral sequence to kind of piece together quantum cohomology. And then there's, there should be some relation between the quantum cohomology of M and the Durham cohomology of M check. And hopefully this leads to, I mean, probably this should lead to some relation between uh, the quantum connection and the Gaussmannian connection. So hopefully this, uh, the, so we're interested in, or the question of like how far can one push this and how much of classical mirror symmetry can one extract from this. So this is kind of the, in the back, back of, uh, at least in the back of my mind when, when I'm thinking about this. And then, yeah, so I'm now repeating myself that somehow if you think of local models for singularities of SYZ vibrations, uh, somehow I'm saying kind of a general word, but FLIR theory is well understood because I don't know how much has been, or I think nothing has actually been written from the point of view of local symplectic homology, but it's still, it should be very well understood. And also another thing, so this uh, relative or local FLIR theory, if you want to kind of study uh, uh, FLIR theory of kind of a local model of singularity, this is a very good tool for, 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 uh, for doing it. But that's like, just as a general remark. Um, okay. Um, so this, this is what we have uh, at the back of, uh, this is what, what's in the back of our minds uh, when we're trying to study this, this question. So we have a local model and we're trying to compare the local model inside some manifold M to kind of the local model, uh, the bare local model. Uh, okay, so now before proceeding, maybe I, let me just mention, I, there's like, there've been a number of talks and there's in this seminar and in, uh, I think about this very question. So I just want to mention them. So, uh, so first of all, there's, uh, there's works in progress. So there's a, there's a, a work that Umut and I are um, um, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Uh, so, so consider the setup where you have a complete embedding of a geometrically bounded symplectic manifold X into M. And when I say X, you can think of X as uh, being the uh, completion of of some Liouville domain. So you have the, it's not just you have a Liouville domain embedded, you have like the entire Liouville domain uh, in, inside, like the entire completion of the Liouville domain inside. Then the, uh, such an embedding induces a, a canonical isomorphism uh, between uh, uh, the relative, uh, between like the lo uh, local symplectic, and then, so, so this is now formulated in terms of uh, arbitrary, like, you can whenever you have a compact manifold inside uh, inside some uh, uh, so actually this should say a k inside x uh, so so whenever you have a compact uh, manifold you can define it's it's local sh and then the claim is that local sh relative to each one of these is the same providing you have this uh, complete embedding and the example that we are considering is ma mainly symplectic cluster varieties 
So these are certain symplectic manifolds which allow, which admit a complete, lots of complete embeddings, such as complete embedding of the cotangent of a torus, complete embeddings of nodal singularities, and, and uh, so on. So, so that's one work, but today's talk uh, uh, will be about a different direction. Then there's another work which is going on, uh, which I'm aware of. Uh, so I'm only talking about things which I'm aware of. Maybe there are things I'm not aware of. Uh, that where, where this idea of kind of comparing uh, local SH, um, uh, the bare local SH with like the embedded local SH is applied to kind of study uh, uh, quantum cohomology of some manifold M uh, uh, by comparing it with symplectic cohomology of the complement of an ample divisor. Of course, there are all kinds of assumptions. I'm not stating like exactly what, what is there. And under, under certain assumptions, uh, there are, uh, they, they can prove certain things. And then there is a talk which I've seen in this seminar by Yu Han Sung, which discussed uh, uh, how, uh, how to uh, talk, uh, displaceability of simply connected Lagrangian Calabrian manifolds by this very same kind of question. And I should say there is a certain degree of overlap between the idea that I will present and uh, well, uh, and uh, Yu Han's uh, talk. Um, and finally, there is a kind of a celebrated result by McLean, which should be mentioned, which proved uh, that birational Calabi-Yaus have the same small quantum cohomology. And I think it also is in this family of results in the sense that it's kind of, well, okay, it's not exactly, but, but in the sense that it kind of compares, it's about kind of, uh, it's related to this. It's not exactly within, within, within it's not exactly, but okay. Um, Okay, so if, uh, okay, before, so before going on, let me pause again for questions. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so there is. Um, okay, so um, okay, so let me go on uh, then. Um, Okay, so, so to state the main result, I need to kind of introduce uh, some definitions. So uh, one definition that I'm introducing now is that we say that a symplectic embedding of a, of a Liouville domain uh, inside a bigger Liouville domain is uh, called essential if the restriction map is an injection. Um, maybe I shouldn't have used the word essential because maybe the essential should be reserved for when uh, kind of when it's when it's unital but okay this, this is what I did um, so yeah note that I'm using essential in a stronger term than maybe uh, people uh, okay but anyhow uh, so 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 this is uh, so an assumption and an example is when we have kind of if if, if the bigger man of the bigger Louisville domain is a neighborhood of a singularity of gross zebra type and the smaller one is a neighborhood of a regular SYZ fiber. So then one can show in the, that in the local model, the uh, restriction map is injective. And the intuition you should have in your mind is that it's kind of, it's related, it's like a restriction of analytic functions to a subdomain. So analytic functions determined by its values on an open, on an open set. Um, okay, so that's one definition. Now let's, the other thing is, let's consider uh, the following uh, categories. Uh, so on the one hand, we have the category whose objects are um, uh, symplectic embeddings of Liouville domains into M, uh, and the morphisms are essential embeddings. And then the other one is the category of uh, real positive numbers, including infinity, and morphisms are the relation uh, A is less than or equal to B. So now I can state my result, which uh, of course, it's like a result in progress. So um, hopefully nobody will refute it during this talk, but uh, uh, I think it's correct. Um, so the claim is uh, there's a functor uh, which goes from this category of Liouville embeddings to, uh, uh, the real, uh, to the category of real numbers, which basically means that it's kind of monotone with respect to these embeddings, such that the following properties hold. So first, so this is just a function. It's a number assigned to, to, to a, a Liouville embedding. So the first uh, axiom or no, the first property is that it measures the degree to which uh, uh, 
the embedding is satisfies locality in the following sense, that if this thing is infinite, I'm not saying anything about what happens that it's finite, but if it's infinite, then uh, first of all, the things we can state in kind of full generality is that if we consider kind of relative symplectic homology of the skeleton, recall I said you can define relative symplectic homology for like arbitrary convex sets. So if you, if you restrict attention to the skeleton itself, then uh, this says that there is an isomorphism. If you do symplectic homology over the Novikov field, then uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you get a non-canonical isomorphism. It's important to say that it's non-canonical. Um, uh, and maybe a more precise statement would have been to say that like there is a canonical thing. The canonical thing is like that there is a grading such that the associated gradeds are canonically isomorphic and it lifts to an isomorphism. Uh, okay, so th that's one thing. Now, if you add an assumption on the, on the Liouville domain, namely that if you compute the, uh, the, the standard symplectic homology over uh, with respect to, to, to the completion, if that is torsion free. So all these Gross-Siebert models, for example, they satisfy this. So, uh, uh, so which is make, it's another way of saying this is there's a model where the differential vanishes. Um, so if, if this is uh, torsion free, then, uh, then the same locality statement holds not just for the skeleton, but also for uh, for kind of a finite a finite uh, a domain of finite uh, thickness any of any finite thickness okay so so that's that's one thing the other property is like how this thing behaves with respect to scaling and what this is saying is that if you scale it this number remains constant so it's it's uh, so now if you combine what I said that it's kind of monotone, so with the fact that it's constant, this means that it depends only on the skeleton. Okay, so that's, that's uh, next. Uh, okay, next I'm, uh, I'm formulating a result, which um, I'm formulating in a more limited way than I believe I should, but for safety. So consider D to be not just any old Liouville domain, but consider that it comes from one of these, uh, it's a, a it's a model for a singularity. Then uh, consider uh, suppose you have kind of a symplectic isotopy. S sorry, you have like an isotopy of like you have a continuous family of symplectic embeddings of of uh, of your Liouville domain. Then you can define a function which uh, for each t takes uh, uh, this invariant tau m, uh, which I will hence refer to as. Uh, the embedding torsion. So if it takes HT to the embedding torsion of this corresponding Liouville domain, you get a function on an interval and this function is first of all continuous. And then a statement which I will explain in a minute, if, uh, if, the, uh, if the isotopy is straight, I will explain in a minute what this means, then this is kind of a concave function on the interval. So before I go on, I will pause for questions. Like, are there any questions besides this thing about what it means for an isotopic to be straight? Um, I, well, I mean, I was going to ask about this torsion-free condition in this in the second statement about locality. Okay. Uh, um, so, is is there some example that I should think about of something which is not torsion but which just has some? So. Uh, well, if I take a ball, then of course it's not torsion free because the whole yeah. thing is torsion. Yes, right, right. But so, but I, I, I don't have an example in my head of something which is non trivial over the Novikov field but has some torsion in it. Uh -huh. um, I don't have an example ready at hand. Uh, okay, that's fine. That's good enough answer. Um, okay, thanks. So, I just wanted to, under to check that I understand something. Um, so you could try to make a very dumb definition of tau just to satisfy this theorem, obviously not the one that the definition you make, where you just define it to be always um, always one, for instance. Um, is the issue that that wouldn't satisfy the last condition of concavity? Yeah, I think that, that wouldn't. 
No, 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 no. That it would define. Uh, it would define. Uh, sorry, it would because because this concavity. Um, yes. So. Um, good point. Maybe I, there should be something which. Uh, I will give the construction of this invariant. I think probably I should have added some axiom here. Okay. Uh, that's, that's not trivial. But yes, that's a good point. Uh, but it wouldn't contradict the concavity because a, concave function, a constant function is concave. So um, yeah, so thanks. Sorry. Uh, yeah, OK. So, so now let's. Uh, um, so can I ask actually one, uh, one more question? Yes. So I, I think I'm missing something about this torsion free statement. So. So if you like, if you took like a small annulus in the two sphere or something like that, wouldn't uh, wouldn't the right hand side be zero since it's displaceable? But wouldn't that still be torsion free? Uh, that would be torsion free, but the 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 like the invariant would would not be infinite. So oh, just... I see, I see that that condition is only if the invariant is infinite. I see. Yes, yes. I'm not I think saying that's that what I was missing. Yeah. So I'm just saying that I have some invariant which measures, uh, which measures. Uh, um, ah, sorry, there is a uh, there is a statement about constancy. Sorry, there is later a statement uh, to, uh, to to go back to Nate's uh, question. Um, there is a statement about this. Uh, um, what happens if it's constant? Uh, then, if it's constant, something happens. This will be the next statement. So that's the, the answer to Nate's question. Unfortunately, not a good enough uh, statement, but still a statement. Okay, so- um, hey, Yoel, so, so did, what's the answer to Kyler's question? Is, is bo are both of those bullet points under that, the assumption of- uh, well, that, If you have an annulus, it doesn't matter. If you have any annulus inside, then it's torsion free. So then this tau really measures whether it's measures locality for it. But tau will be finite. So, 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 so both bullet points are under the assumption that uh, it's infinite. Yes, 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 yes. Um, OK, yeah. So, so there will be an answer to next question in a minute. What, what, what this is like, what is the non triviality here? Uh, OK, but let me just explain what does it mean to have a straight path. So if you have a path maybe of, Before you move but, on, I think that there's one more question. Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, Yegor, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Yes, so, so uh, yeah, I was wondering how uh, tau of uh, SYZ fiber is related to the psi invariant of SYZ fiber. That's, uh, the psi invariant is the thing that was defined in your paper with uh, Dimitri. No, I'm not saying it's the same. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's greater than or equal to that or something like that. What I, uh -huh. is what I, oh, so, this is interesting. Is, is, kind of, both are concave yeah, assumptions less, of the... It's a weaker thing than your thing. So maybe it's less than or equal. Um, sorry. If the is infinite, tau invariant is infinite. Uh, if the tau invariant is infinite, it's not necessarily the case that the psi invariant is infinite. That's it. Um, mm. Okay. Uh, and it's, I mean, this also is inspired, as I would say, by... I mean, the, the philosophy is inspired by that, by that paper, so. Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so what is the meaning of uh, a straight path? Uh, well, you have like, if you, you, have, an, uh, you have a path of, of embeddings of legal domains, then this gives you some kind of element in the cohomology, which is defined by uh, integrating um, somehow you want, you want to define an element in, in cohomology with values in R, so you need a functional on homology classes. To, to an homology class, you kind of uh, consider what uh, the cylinder that is traced out by it, and then you integrate omega. That's not, in, that's not well defined, but uh, since you also have these primitives, that exactly uh, makes it well defined. So, uh, so, 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 so you get something which is defined on homology, and which depends only on endpoint preserving homotopy class. So, so, so this means that any path of embeddings traces out a path in the cohomology of values in R, and then you can, um, uh, and then you can uh, uh, talk about straight straight paths. 
Okay, and then this leads to the final property, which will answer, uh, sorry, did, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so the final property is, well, this is kind of an axiom, which is unfortunately, it's not kind of an elementary thing. I don't, so this is something which also in uh, the paper on the sign vert, there's something called the divisor class axiom. So this kind of corresponds to it. So it says that under the same assumption uh, on D, meaning under, uh, for now, under the assumption that it's a singular SYZ fiber, uh, sorry, it's kind of a neighborhood of an SYZ, whether a singular or non-singular, then if tau is constant and finite along a straight path, and that straight path has some tangent vector alpha, then there must be a non-trivial flow trajectory such that um, kind of the class of the boundary is in the kernel of this alpha. Um, it's kind of a complicated statement, uh, but uh, hopefully it will be uh, applicable. Uh, okay, is it clear what this, uh, um, what this statement is saying? Um, um, please ask questions. Um, okay, so so I will uh, so uh, and let me comment. I believe that the last two properties, even though I stated them only for singularities, the rest I believe they should hold for arbitrary uh, Liouville domains. Uh, so okay, so now let me kind of discuss maybe a, a good way to to to. Uh, okay, so. Uh, um, let me just ask a, a, a stupid question. So when you say boundary U, you mean like one of its boundary ends, right? It... No, it's like the sum, like the boundary. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I mean, it's the, or maybe it's it's kind of the the, the image, like, like you have kind of a relative, it's, it's kind of a, a, an element U, it's kind of a, it represents a relative homology class. Maybe I should have written, maybe, maybe it should be written as, that's maybe a better, that would be better. Um, so, so you have a, a relative, like U is a relative, is a class which kind of ends. Um, so, so, so there must, so I'm talking about some, something which ends uh, with both ends in, in, in D. And uh, so it has, uh, so, so. so the, I see, so the ends, the ends are kind of homologous in yes. D, but not, but they're homologous in M, but a priori not in, in D, so. Right. They're homologous in M, but not in D. And the claim is that they have to be like kind of homologous modulo kernel of alpha. That's, uh, uh, okay, so we will apply the Fleur, Fleur homo When you say Fleur trajectory with respect to what Fleur data is, or do you mean something like a homomorphic curve or something? Like yeah, this is the statement is like with respect. So yeah, it's not a very well stated thing. It means that there is on in the background there is a choice of flow data, uh, and um, and with respect to that choice of flow data, this holds. I, I admit that this kind of, like this is the thing which should tell you the non-triviality, and there's still some kind of work to make this a better a better looking result. Uh, uh, but yes, but the statement what it is is that there is some underlying flow data. Like pick any any kind of uh, I mean there's a scheme for picking uh, flow data for computing uh, uh, um, the the, the uh, relative symplectic homology and uh, there's uh, and I mean that scheme has some restrictions and within if if it's done with uh, flow data from that within that scheme then this thing should hold okay so I, I admit that this should be improved but that's what uh, what I have now. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, okay, maybe I'll skip these remarks. Ah, so yeah, I do want to say that this, this, like the idea here, uh, is kind of inspired. So, so there is a this work by by Shluchin, uh, uh, and Vienna. So they have, they have this result, and uh, the idea, uh, the, the philosophy uh, builds on, on on the ideas there. Uh, however, you shouldn't think that this is just some kind of uh, uninspired imitation. There is some a lot of non-trivial stuff or, orthogonal to this. Okay, uh, and and also to answer Igor's question, uh, somehow, if we have kind of 
sufficient foundations for like the open, closed open map, then unobstructedness of an SYZ fiber should imply, um, okay, I said locality for a neighborhood of the fiber, but I mean is it should imply that the tau invariant is infinite. Uh, but there is foundations to, 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 to build. Uh, and then let me just uh, uh, talk about how kind of we would apply these axioms. So again, I don't have a result because of this last thing, but a possible result. So, so consider the case where you have like an elliptically fibered uh, K3 surface. Uh, uh, you, you apply a hypercalar rotation, uh, uh, then you get a, a symplectic, uh, 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 like a, an SYZ vibration over, over a sphere, and the regular fibers are Lagrangian tori, uh, singular fibers are nodal tori, and then, uh, and then the, the argument goes like this. So consider if P is a star-shaped domain, which say does not contain any singularity, then if you take X, so for X and P, if you take a generic line, uh, you can kind of, the Lagrangian can be kind of isotoped uh, along arbitrarily long lines with no obstruction. And this means that the tau invariant, so, 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 uh, uh, so, so, so this means the tau invariant is basically constant on any, on any line. And now we would like to know, uh, um, so if we, if we kind of pick the line to be irrational, we get that uh, the kernel of alpha equals zero. So if we could rule out cylinders which start and end on the same orbit, it would follow that locality holds. I'm not sure, I think a BV kind of a BV type, I'm kind of hoping that kind of a BV operator type of argument would, would do that. So if we could rule out these particular cylinders, then we would get that uh, locality holds for the, for the for the um, for the tori, and then you could uh, um, now, if you consider uh, Q to be like uh, a neighborhood which does contain a singular value, then the tau invariant of the of of uh, of of the of this neighborhood which does contain a singular value is uh, at least the tau invariant which of the of the neighborhood which doesn't. So it's also so this means that its uh, locality would hold also for the singular value. So, so the achievement here is that if you know locality for the, reg, for the regular fibers, which uh, if you're good with uh, um, uh, Lagrange, like uh, with the FO cubed, for example, um, and you have, there is, I don't know, like there you have this uh, divisor class axiom, I think it's called. Uh, then, then we deduce the same thing also for the singular fiber. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of, of a way of, of, of a potential application, which I hope will be uh, improved so that it can really be made into an unconditional state. Uh, uh, okay, are there any questions uh, up to here? Okay, so um, okay, so I think I'll move on. So now let me try to explain how how uh, how is this invariant constructed and what 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 kinds of ideas go into the proof. Um, okay, so uh, so what we do is we like to construct fluid cohomology over the Novik of ring. So we consider that we have a, a sequence of uh, Hamiltonians, a monotone increasing sequence, and which converges kind of to the characteristic function. So it's zero converges to zero inside to infinity outside. And then we add some kind of additional assumption that A, so, so H is said to be kind of S-shaped if it has a particular behavior near the boundary. So it's kind of contact type near the boundary. And then away from the boundary of, of D, it should, have, it should have small oscillation and only uh, trivial uh, um, periodic orbits. And when I said small, I mean, there has to be some fixed constant, which I didn't specify, and it has to be smaller than that constant. Um, okay, so if you, and that, that is needed for later, for, for what I'm going to say later. Uh, so at, at, at first approximation, you should think of something which is just exactly zero outside. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, so for given a periodic orbit, we can define the action. So we have it, we're using kind of a, a one form which is not globally defined, um, but 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 uh, but this thing is this action is well defined because of the S, the S shaped condition because anything which is far away from D must be a constant. So 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 it makes sense. Okay, so, so we have kind of an action defined even so we're in a setting we're in a non exact setting but we have some kind of ac uh, action filtration defined. Uh, okay, so we're going to the cohomology. So we consider the Novikov ring. It's very important that we're working with the ring and not the field. Um, then we, we uh, consider the, uh, so I, I use this zero to denote that I'm, I'm working with the uh, mo uh, kind of the Fleur cohomology of the Novikov ring, the chain complex of the Novikov ring. Uh, and then there is, on this, so, so this is a, mod, a finite rank module of the Novikov ring, and we define on it a non-Archimedean norm, which uh, in this way, so so it has somehow the larger the action, uh, the larger the norm, but the larger the lambda, the, like the smaller the norm. So T lambda may, makes things small when lambda goes comes big, but action gamma makes things big. And then there's also a non-Archimedean valuation which just measures lambda. So, so it's very important that in this discussion, we're distinguishing between measuring things uh, between the valuation and the action. Uh, okay, and then given a Fleur trajectory, which connects uh, orbits uh, of HI, we define kind of a weight, which is basically to integrate the relative class uh, omega theta over, over U. Okay, this is a well-defined notion. And then an important technical lemma is that if we carefully choose uh, um, H, I, and J, then uh, there is a positive number such that uh, there are three possibilities. Either, so, so you have like three types of orbits. You either have orbits, not orbits, there are three types of flow trajectories. You have either flow trajectories which kind of, whose relative energy is zero and, and it ma they map inside of D or you have things whose relative energy is zero, but they just, they're just gradient trajectories which connect critical points which are outside of D. And then you, you, uh, anything which is not one of these two types, uh, uh, so anything which uh, uh, must, must uh, uh, have uh, uh, relative energy, uh, at least H bar, okay? So, so um, and this is kind of an integrated maximum principle. So, um, so even though, so things can go outside, but you can, you can kind of, uh, you have some way of filter of separating things which go outside from things which stay inside. Uh, okay, so now we can define uh, a differential and continuation maps by counting flow trajectories weighted, weighted by this relative energy. And then what's important to, to, to keep in mind is that under the differential continuation maps, the norm, which, uh, which was defined before using the action, uh, that norm always uh, decreases under differential continuation maps. And also the valuation, the valuation also is, sorry, the valuation has like this opposite monotonicity. It's kind of non-decreasing under differential continuation maps. Okay, so this means we can define, this means uh, that we can define, uh, we, somehow we have something well-defined over the Novikov ring um, because because of the, this claim about the valuation, um, so so we can just take a kind of a direct limit, and this direct limit carries like an induced norm and induced valuation, and then we can take a completion with respect to the norm. Uh, so I didn't really spell. I should have written a formula for what what yeah. So without writing a formula for what this completion means, you have a norm, and uh, so so. When you complete, oh, let me write it just here. So completion just means you take the uh, inverse limit, you do limit um, uh, so, so, so I don't have the notation ready at hand, so I won't write it up, but, but what it does is it does two things. First, I was just saying words what it does. So, so what it does is first it kills uh, uh, anything which whose norm is converges to zero, get, gets killed by, by this 
by this completion, and then you get uh, certain infinite, uh, and you also allow infinite sums. You get certain infinite sums uh, as long as they kind of satisfy. So you can have like an infinite sum t uh, lambda i uh, gamma i, and anything which has this uh, norm, as long as this uh, goes to zero, then uh, then such sums are allowed. Sorry, this disappeared. Okay, so. Uh, so the completion is kind of meant to kill these uh, uh, outside orbits. And then the important thing to remember about this is that this, uh, um, uh, uh, so this completed thing, it's, it's a completion with respect to the norm. So it's not complete with respect to val m, meaning if you have like an infinite sum of uh, 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 like sum t i lambda i, and all you know is Oh, let me go back to this. So all you know is that these lambda i's go to infinity. Sorry, do you see my, ah, yeah. So, so these lambda i's go to infinity, that's not enough because you need also to know that it, it has to be the combined thing. Uh, so these gamma i's, they have kind of bounds norms which, which can also go to infinity. And this is, this is important for, for like from a technical point of view. Okay, uh, so this is the, the thing we have defined. And then we can define symplectic homology. Uh, with respect to, to this, uh, to the over the Novikov ring, with respect to this evaluation. Uh, and then uh, looking at this, we can define a numerical invariant. And the way we define the numerical invariant is that, uh, um, so, uh, um, so given an element X, you can measure its torsion. So that's lambda, that gives you a number lambda X. Uh, so it should say probably T to the lambda. Sorry, um, uh, um, and then okay. So given an a torsion element, we can look at kind of the length of the of the longest kind of bar, which can like I don't maybe there's kind of we look at the the largest thing which can kind of divide it, uh, and then we take our invariant as kind of the infimum. So, so you should imagine that when you when you do a, a uh, when you take uh, cohomology, you get something which has kind of torsion parts and non-torsion parts, and the torsion parts have certain lengths, and you just take the smallest, the small, the, the smallest, the infimum over lengths of, of, of the torsion parts. This, this is the invariant that we're, we're studying. Uh, okay, so that, that's the definition. Um, and there's an alternative definition in terms of spectral sequences where you could think of it as kind of measuring what is the first page, like you have a, fil a filtration, you're asking what is the first page where, the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, where you have a non-trivial differential. And so, so, so the interpretation of kind of what, what it means for, uh, for tau to be infinite is that the spectral sequence degenerates at page one. Uh, now, but here's the thing, you have to be very cautious because this, this filtration is like infinite and non-complete. So it's not like the fact that the, this spectral sequence degenerates, it's not so trivial to interpret. So it's like, basically there is an example which, uh, so, so there's, uh, so for example, if you take a sphere, let me just draw it over here. So Ul, Ul, can I make you pause? The spectral sequence, it's associated to, to the, to the sum of the exponent of t and the the value yeah. of the primitive. I'm, I just keep okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's filtration with respect to this uh, t. Yes. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's not filtration with respect to the norm. It's filtration only with respect to like there's this ah. thing that I call val, val m. So basically, so, only only the actual area of the of the cylinders. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. The area of the cylinders, and the fact that it's incomplete. Uh, so, so for example, you, you have, like, if you consider, if you consider a disc inside of, of, of the sphere and this disc has, uh, uh, has area more than half the, the sphere, then that spectral sequence degenerates. But if you analyze what that spectral sequence, you, you get some kind of non, like when you have like, uh, that's like a non-Hausdorff uh, filtration. So, so it's something called weak convergence. So, so, so so this, the fact that the spectral sequence generates does not give you uh, much information in that case. So, so 
So one has to be careful. That's why one has to introduce uh, those caveats that, that, that I uh, introduced, where you either assume that the torsion is finite, sorry, you either introduce, uh, assume the torsion is zero, or you go to the skeleton, um, which I will get to in a minute. But I, I want to get across, uh, before I, I go there, I just want to say, uh, so uh, how do we, so, so okay, so this is a numerical invariant that we can define, but then the question is how exactly do we, uh, how can we study the properties of this, of this invariant? Uh, so I want to say, I can't really explain this in the, within the uh, framework of the cell, but it's the a really great difficulty when you start analyzing things is that flare trajectories go uh, between inside and outside generators in ways that are very difficult to separate. So, uh, so and it's, it's kind of something which is not, there's no way to control it as far as I know, because there's no compactness, like, like you could have, you could have kind of a, an inner generator going to, like there's no, you can't say that starting from some I, things uh, stabilize. So, so you, you have, this is about as much as I can say about this. But there is, there is kind of, um, there's, uh, there's kind of one good property is that somehow, maybe I should at least draw something, sorry. So, so what am I saying? So I'm saying when you compute this, you're using kind of S-shaped Hamiltonians. So you have orbits coming from here, you have orbits coming from here, and you also have some critical points coming from here. And, and you can have flare trajectories connecting things in arbitrary ways. So you can't, can't split things. And, and it's a real headache to deal with, with, with these things. They make the, this relation, for example, between the filtration and the norm pretty hard to deal with. Um, but you have some kind of behavior, some kind of control, which is that if you have an, so, so if an outer generator, for example, survives in the limit, so, so notice, like if you look at an outer generator, this action part, we have kind of a negative H. So, so this action part goes to, uh, uh, goes to uh, minus infinity. So, so, so so, so the norm, if, if you consider uh, uh, an outside generator, so in, gen in general, the norm of this outside generator goes to, uh, goes to zero, so it gets killed in the completion. But as you apply iterated continuation maps, this, this thing could at some point hit some inner orbit. So, so that's how it could survive. But that's the only way it could survive. And then inner generators, they always preserve the norm. So it turns out, uh, and this is the technical achievement of this work, which, uh, uh, which uh, I won't. I don't have. I won't be able to get into. But I want to get across that this is somehow. There's a way of. There's a homological perturbation method of kind of dealing with this. So consider uh, you have a module um, which is generated by kind of uh, exactly by by uh, rib orbits. Uh, um, like you have a generate uh, uh, rib orbits and critical points. So there's no outside generators. And then you assign to each uh, critical point the norm one, and to each reap or orbit the norm kind of given by the period. Uh, and maybe I should have said you complete. With, you take uh, you take the completion of this thing with respect to the norm. Uh, so so there is an algorithm for constructing a differential on this uh, on this uh, on this uh, module this completed module v star d, and so on. Uh, and an isomorphism of chain complexes such that uh, both the val m and the norm are preserved. So, so given this homological perturbation algorithm, you can really think of relative symplectic cohomology as just being something which is generated by rib orbits inside, uh, rib orbits uh, on the boundary and critical points inside with co uh, configurations which kind of consist, so it's a homological perturbation, so they consist of combinations of, of differentials and continuation maps go going uh, all over the place. Okay, and now uh, let me sketch as much as I can uh, what how, how you prove uh, these various things. So, um, so first of all, uh, I said that this assignment, I, I described to you what the assignment is. So I said that it satisfies some kind of a functoriality statement, which means uh, monotonicity. So this monotonicity comes from, uh, so at, whenever you have an inclusion, you have like you have a filtration preserving restriction map in the opposite direction, so you get an induced map of spectral sequences. And this injectivity assumption, like this assumption we said, uh, uh, essential embedding that satisfies some kind of injectivity, means that if you have a bound, if if somehow, if the boundary is zero up to page R, and 
for, for, the, for the smaller domain, that it must also be uh, so for the bigger domain. So this, this gives the functoriality. Um, why this is a measure of locality, this has to do with nonsense about general nonsense about spectral sequences. So if you consider, if you go to the skeleton, the skeleton is complete with respect to Val M. So the generation of the spectral sequence really does imply that you have an isomorphism. Similarly, if you have torsion free freedom with respect somehow of the, of the local model, then uh, somehow the image of the undeformed differential is finite dimensional. Uh, so this time you don't have complete with respect to Valam, but you can still prove that the generation implies uh, isomorphism. So, so this is kind of a general nonsense thing about uh, um, spectral uh, sequences. And let just, well, in the minute I have remaining, I will just get across one idea about F, um, 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 so there's the remaining properties. What's important to me is just the scaling property. Um, so, so the scaling property here, uh, I'm using uh, a trick, which uh, I actually learned, like I was thinking about this together with Umut uh, like three years ago. And then he suggested this idea that you can kind of, there is a, a version of the Fukaya trick, which works in, in the case of, um, uh, a version of the, which works for contact, uh, the contact version, it's called the contact Fukaya trick. So you can set things up. So when you scale your Liouville domain, you have uh, bijections between the generators and flirt trajectories defining each, each of these areas. Now, if you apply the contact Fukaya trick together with homological perturbation, you get that uh, both uh, the, simplex, uh, the, the domain D and its rescale domain are defined by uh, differentials uh, on, on, uh, on essentially the same mod module, uh, um, uh, but so, uh, however, like there's kind of this isomorphism is not like this map is not an is kind of an, a dense injection, but it's not an isomorphism because completions are different. However, like th this this uh, property, like this value of tau, it depends only on somehow the finite sums. So so uh, maybe I'm not make, maybe this is like too much for the uh, for the last minute. So uh, so it kind of so, so somehow if you want to compute what is uh, uh, um, you want to tell what is uh, this value of tau, you do an infimum over certain things. Let me just, just put it down there. It's kind of an infimum over certain uh, witnesses. And there's a bijection between the witnesses because witnesses, th this is one of the reasons why you need this homological perturbation scheme. Somehow witnesses, which will give you this thing, come from kind of the finite part. You have a bijection and then you have the same, the same somehow it's, it's about putting uh, relative values on kind of re uh, on relative classes. So, so basically you're kind of evaluating relative things over, over so, so you have some, some neural domain and you're looking at things which, which map inside here and you're doing a relative class. So, so rescaling does not change the, the, the uh, does not change the value. And then there's similar ideas for, uh, for, for kind of the concavity uh, when you do, when you have this concavity thing, uh, sorry, when you have this isotopy, then things do uh, change by certain linear, uh, th then you have kind of an infimum of the linear functions, but that's something I don't have time to explain. So I think I will just stop here. Uh, so, thank you. Let's give Yoel a hand. Okay, uh, any, any questions for Yoel? Maybe I'll start off with one. Um, so there is this slide, it was like 60% of the way through about an application of mirror symmetry. And you mentioned, I think something about um, a possible argument with the BV operator. I was wondering if you could say a word or two about that. No, I don't really have much to say. Um, okay. It's kind of a hope, but... Uh... I, maybe somebody here has something to say, but uh, um, ask. Uh, 
maybe it was implicit uh, or you already said that, but do you think uh, that this tau invariant can, uh, of some devil domain of a, of a Lagrangian tau can detect whether uh, the tau is weakly unobstructed or not? Weakly unobstructed. Like uh, the marker tan equation has a, the, the ah, can it go solution. to another direction? Like I'm thinking that if it's, I think, I think weak on obstructiveness already implies that kind of that this tau and variant is infinite. I think if weak on obstructiveness means what you just said that the Morgan has a solution, I'm pretty sure. But I don't think there's something the opposite. Like this is kind of a weaker. The C is infinite for what? What? It's, um, it's, a, it's an invariant of it's, it's a number. It's an invariant of the skeleton. So you can think of it as an invariant. Uh -huh. Numerical invariant for the uh, it kind of measures the closed string on deformedness. So kind of open string on deformedness knows all about closed strings. So it tells you that also closed string on deformedness. But I don't. I, don't I, I wouldn't expect that you can go in the opposite direction. Okay. So to summarize, if it is weakly unobstructed, then yes, then it this should be infinite. But what this thing gives, it's kind of a weaker invariant, but it uh, works for singular objects. That's what, that's a way of, of, of thinking about this. Um, I wanted to ask about this no torsion condition. Can you go back to the slide? Sorry. First, I wanted to, to so th this is a, c a condition, of course, that, as you say, does not refer to the completion. It does not refer, I'm sorry, to the M that is embedded in. It's just about the domain is completion. Um, do you, and then you said something about how, you know, in the local SYZ examples, there is no torsion. Yes. Okay, so what is the justification of that? So for local abyaus, um Okay, maybe I shouldn't say things like that. So I think, for example, Pascal's papers on paper on local labial mm -hmm. shows this for surfaces because you build something where the differential is zero. Um, I think dance. Okay, 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 but let, let me make you pause. So this is a statement about a very specific domain. Like, I mean, if if I don't think like a mirror symmetry person, and I think about like a I think like a symplectic topologist. I could imagine that I could take one of these domains and I kind of deform the boundary a little bit. You know, okay. like, it's, it's independent of, it depends only on the skeleton because you have monotonicity on the one hand and on the other hand, you have that it's kind of, inver it's constant under scaling. So you combine these two things. Um, I see. And and you can and I guess maybe this is something that was and you're not you're not using any condition about C one. What is C one? First term class. Uh, oh God, um, I don't know. I, I don't want to answer. Um, like I'm always thinking about Calabria. I, I don't. I wouldn't want to. Like I should be very careful. I, I don't know. Like I, I I haven't. I kind of have this. Uh, Everything I said should be, uh, by, by default, is about uh, C1 equals zero. Uh, uh, maybe I should, yeah, I should be more careful. Uh, I think, I think, okay, okay. It's just that it's, it's kind of, uh, these, this phenomena where something only depends on the skeleton, mm -hmm. I, I tend to think that that's the kind of property that's more robust in the C1 equals zero case than in general, but, um, He's, he's doing the other completion. So this, but yeah, can I also ask a question? Yes, I'm done. So, so how do you show that this, uh, the you know, the FLIR trajectories increase action in the way that you defined? I'm kind of, I'm worried about the orbits outside of the okay. domain. Uh, it's, it's, it's the integral, uh, what, what are you talking, what is the question? No, I understand that it does, if it con connects two okay. orbits inside the, Okay. inside D, near D. But how so do you show it? Because I think the action 
mm -hmm. that you define for the constant yeah. orbits. So you're saying you have kind of a constant orbit in here. Yeah, how yeah. do you show that, you know, that, something that goes between. Uh, okay, because, okay, because if it goes between this, so since this is a constant orbit, this, we can consider it, we can think of it as like a disk. Um, and what I, what do I want to show? There are two things. So there's the, what, the, the norm decreases, that's kind of a general thing. That's like, floor theory always guarantees that. No, no, wait, well, well, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm confused which one you, uh, the, the one which, where you use the action of. Okay, so, so in the end, there are two things that should be, that I'm saying should be positive, okay? Um, one thing that is the, the lemma that I stated, and that was that the, if you take in such a setting, if, so if you have U, an EM U is greater than or equal to zero. And that, uh, that follows by the integrated maximum principle. No, again, it's I don't understand how you would. That's why. Saying, uh, you do the integral of of of. of no, yeah, I, I told you this argument, so I know the argument, but it's uh, okay. it's the I'm talking about uh, the when you consider it with the with, between. So you're saying you like is it essential that it's S shaped, for example? Is that um, like, it's, well, it's there's a, something you're yeah. using something there that's this is. To me, this is what's uh, yeah. new in this. Uh, Try to describe. There is a claim that this thing. Uh, I, I forgot which one was the was EM. Okay, there, there, when you have a fluid trajectory, there are two. Uh, there are two things. There is so, something which I called EM, which is just the integral of uh, of u star omega minus uh, um, the uh, this. Okay, and if you, a quick and dirty argument is that this thing causes- so you, you filled it into a disk, for example, when you fill it into a disk, data doesn't actually make sense at the bottom, like- I'm not filling it into it. There is kind of here, there is this th this thing, if it can, if it goes, if it has a critical point outside, periodic orbit in here, okay? Then here you have, you, you can, there is a well-defined notion and whenever you have a closed, if you have a closed form, closed to form, and then you have a primitive of the two form on some, on some domain, and then you have something whose boundary is in that domain. And you can integrate. There's a okay. Yes. There's yes. Right. So, so what? What? So you're now you're considering a solution which with one end at the constant orbit and with one end inside the domain. Yeah. So the integrated maximum principle basically gives you positivity of this thing, and quick and dirty, but maybe not. This thing is kind of positive because of kind of monotonicity argument. Because this is basically zero uh, outside here. Um, um, I think I'm not using this, but this is the thing which is, is coming to my mind right now. Uh, this thing, kind, kind, kind of you can consider this, uh, like I'm pretty sure that this is not what I need to use because it's something much more elementary, but what I'm uh, remembering right now is somehow the part which is, uh, you're integrating, like here you have kind of an equation of integral of u star omega is, is essentially the energy, the, like. Um, so this is the quick and dirty. I think there, there's a, a less quick and dirty way of uh, of seeing this, this positivity. I think it's just like, just the integrated maximum principle should give it. But this is what I can come up with uh, right now. So, so this is one thing. Then there's the other thing. So, so, so then the other thing is just to, to ver verify, like, um, so like that's the only thing that's, that, that's a claim. Like the other thing that the norm uh, decreases, that's just, that's just about re rewriting things because you could write things by like, I'm, I'm kind of, my generators, I'm taking them to be T to the action. Um, uh, so, so, so when you write, when you rewrite them in this way, uh, it just turns out that the norm is just like the difference in norm or the difference in law of the norm is just the standard topological energy, uh, which is known to be uh, positive. Uh, 
So like, would you expect this? Uh, so to let me just suggest that we um, yeah. see if there are any other questions before yeah, we get yeah, too yeah. deep into this discussion. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask a quick one actually, um, sort of related to this. Um, when you had that maximum principle like argument and you said that the J and the H needed to be chosen carefully, was mm -hmm. that compatible in some standard sense, or was it more special than that? Uh, okay, when I said chosen carefully, there are two things. So, so the HIs need to be chosen carefully. Like, the eight, like there is something about ge uh, geometry where I said that there's an estimate where you have some H bar. So, so you need to somehow the geometry of H and J need to be kind of controlled. But then there was something about, which is not as important, you need to control, uh, pick things generically so that if things connect critical points, they, uh, they must be gradient trajectories, which I think is not that important for the argument, but that was the, what the lemma said. Okay. And yeah, so, so, and I mean, I think this is also a general fact, but again, I, in back of my mind, I'm just using standard, uh, no virtual techniques, because I know nothing about them, so. Maybe I should say everything's under the assumption that C1 equals zero. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, let me ask if there are any more questions before we end the kind of formal question period. Okay. So let's give Yoel one more hand. Thanks a lot, Yoel, for the great talk. 